Good morning. Good morning. So here I am for my first post-baby sermon. We will see how it goes. Um, so we're in the second week of Advent right now. Um, and for the next few weeks, which I just confirmed with John, like, 10 minutes before the service. <laughs> we'll be looking through the season of Christmas, the season of Advent through the lens of uh, the three classic pillars of uh, Christian life, faith, hope, and love. Um, so this week we'll be looking at Advent through the eyes of faith, and um, for that, I couldn't think of a better passage than uh, Luke chapter two. So if you'll turn with me, um, Luke chapter two, verse 22. It's a little bit after Jesus is born, so it's a little bit of a spoiler. Guess what? He gets born. Um, but Luke chapter 2, verse 22. And if you read with me. So when the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon, who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went to the temple courts, and when the parents brought him the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. And jump down to 36. Now there was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel of the tribe Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage and then was a widow until she was 84. And she never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. So will you pray with me? So Lord, as we look into your word this morning, um, we pray first of all that you give us the ears to listen pray that your spirit will speak um, through me, in me, beside me, um, in spite of me, and um, may we all hear what you have to say for us this morning. Um, we pray and ask this in your mighty name. Amen. So Advent is called the season of waiting. It is this time of year when we as a church take a posture of waiting, waiting for Christmas and the coming of Jesus into the world. And the problem with this season is that, um, as a people, we're just not very good at waiting. We demand things to happen, and we demand things to happen faster than ever before. We live in the age of lightning-fast internet speeds. We live in the age of Amazon Prime two-day shipping, of <laughs> smartphones, of tablets, or in the plethora of other devices that get us information, goods, services faster than ever before. With a click of a button, I can do all my buddy banking. With a click of a button, I can book an airline ticket anywhere in the world. So telling us we have to wait, that we might be delayed, that we'll be thrown off our meticulously planned schedules. It's one of the worst things you could say to us. In fact, I just got an email from UPS telling me one of my packages was gonna be delayed and won't arrive within my ridiculously fast two-day window. And I found myself getting slightly annoyed. You know, this book that I ordered, I was gonna be deprived of it for one more day. How dare they? Um, the comedian Louis C.K., uh, he pointed how ridiculous we are about facing any delays, especially about travel delays. He said, and I, I, I'm gonna paraphrase here because first of all, I gotta clean it up. Second of all, I can't quite remember what he said. But he, he was just talking and he was saying, uh, he met someone who you know, talked about, he was, they went on, they went on a flight from LA to New York and it got delayed 45 minutes. And he was like, I'm sorry, your flight to LA to New York got delayed 45 minutes. You mean a journey that used to take 30 years, where a bunch of you would die along the way from dysentery, cholera, and bears, and you would have babies, and you'd be a completely different people when you arrived than when you left? 
I guess, yeah, 45 minutes, you were delayed. <laughs> and I think that's why we have a problem with the season. We're used to getting things fast, we're used to getting things now. The season of Christmas is all about when can we open up the presents, when can we get all the things. We don't know what to do with having to wait, other than being annoyed, other than being frustrated, other than giving up. But in our scripture today, that's exactly what we find two people of God, Simeon and Anna, having to do. Now we get to see the end of the story of waiting. We get to see them when the waiting is fulfilled and they get to see Jesus. But make no mistake, this is a story of people who had to wait for the Lord and wait a long time. The Bible tells us that Anna was old, at least 84, and that she had been coming to the temple day and night for many years, praying and waiting for the Lord to come. And Simeon, uh, many Bible scholars have suggested, was also nearing the end of his life, waiting for the fulfillment of a promise that God had made to him. He would not die before he saw the Messiah. And the fact that these people had been waiting until the end of their lives, it really tells only half the story of the agony of waiting they had to endure. Because you see, they inherited this waiting. Israel as a whole had been waiting for a long time. They had been waiting almost half a millennia for a promised savior to deliver them from their enemies. And in that half a millennia, Israel had seen time and time again, not signs of hope that the Messiah was coming around the corner, but they had seen setback after setback after setback after setback. They had seen their temple destroyed. They had seen the nation of Israel scattered into exile. And even when they returned from exile, only a few of them returned. They saw themselves only a small remnant of Israel coming back. Most of them were lost forever. So when Israel finally returned from, Israel, uh, from exile, it was only a shell of its former self. And as we read in Nehemiah, they had a temple that paled in glory to the one that preceded it. Everything was worse. And from that time in exile, Israel returned, not as an independent nation, but returned as a tributary of great empires that kept conquering them from Babylonians to Persians to Greeks to Romans. They saw their nation governed by the whims of foreign rulers. They saw every attempt at independence, every attempt at insurrection squashed by the much more powerful military powers that ruled them. And generation after generation after generation passed without even the hint of a Messiah coming. Parents would tell their children, and then their children would tell their children, and their children would tell their ch children, a Messiah is coming. But that promise never seemed to come to pass. And so by the time Simeon and Anna stumble upon this little child in the temple, they had inherited a history of disappointment, suffering, and woe. They had inherited a history of waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. And there were three choices that Simeon and Anna could have made in this time of waiting. The first choice was to despair. In the face of no evidence of God's coming and the face of the oppression and suffering, many in Israel decided to do exactly that. And despair is more than just mourning the brokenness of our world. It's more than just feeling helpless about a situation, but despair is more like a defensive posture. It's a posture of retreat from the world. It's to see the problems of the world as insurmountable. And so in an act of self-preservation, we stop trying to solve it, the problems. Instead, we focus on protecting ourselves and our own interests. That's the posture of despair. The posture of despair is to privatize our religion so that all that matters is my personal faith with Jesus and nothing else, even if it has no impact on the world. The posture of despair is to cease being salt and light, to see this world as a scary place 
not worth agonizing over. And so we set up our religious expectations accordingly. So that was one choice. The second choice would have been just to give up entirely, to call the whole enterprise a sham, to say that God's promises, it's taken 500 years, what's happening? Let's just give up entirely. And in the case of, Israelite, of the Israelites, again, many of them took that path. They took a look at their circumstances, they took a look at their oppressors and rulers and decided, well, if you can't beat them, join them. Instead of decrying the injustices of their time, they decided to participate in it, to take advantage of the financial and powerful power benefits that they would get from siding with their oppressors, from following their conquerors. But then there's a choice that Simeon and Anna took, which was to faithfully wait. Now, what does it mean to faithfully wait? I think to know that, we have to understand more clearly what faith means. And I think that's something that I have misunderstood in the past. I think it's something we tend to get wrong. Because I tended to think of faith as what I believe. My faith is a set of beliefs about God, about scripture, about church, about the world, about sin and salvation. Faith was equated with my creeds and confessions, you know. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, yada, 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 yada. Um, so of the three pillars of Christian life, you know, faith, hope, and love, faith was the most cerebral one. It was the one most concerned with content and knowledge. And so in a sense, faith is the easiest one to maintain because if faith involves knowledge, then all I have to do is acquire knowledge and I'm good. If we read enough of the Bible, if we read enough Christian books, if we hear the right amount of sermons, if we hear the right amount of Christian speakers, if we spend enough time studying theology, then our faith will be built up. But that's to misunderstand faith. As I read in this passage, I see that Simeon and Anna's faith is not one based on knowledge of God and doctrine and Bible, but faith cuts to the very core of our being. And weirdly enough, it took, I didn't really grasp it until um, I saw recently the Disney movie Aladdin. I know. I have a kid for three months and already all my references are G-rated. But, but, but there is this one scene. Um, it's Jasmine the princess is up on a balcony and um, she's talking to Aladdin who's flying on his magic carpet. And Aladdin is, in, is inviting her to come on this ride and Jasmine looks, around, looks at it and says, is, thinks is it safe? Is it worth going on? Can I go? It's a flying carpet. Like, who, who, who goes on a flying carpet? And Aladdin goes on and asks her, Do you trust me? Do you trust me? And that's when I realized that the heart of faith is not knowledge. The heart of faith is, Do you trust me? For Jasmine, it was faith in Aladdin and a magic carpet. For us, the stakes are a little bit higher. Simeon had faith in God and his promises in that he trusted that God was going to fulfill those promises. He trusted that God would fulfill his promises, that he would not die before he saw the Messiah. The heart of faith is not knowledge. The heart of faith is trust. The question, do you have faith in God or do you believe in God, should better be asked, do you trust him? Do you trust that he will do what he has promised? So rather than being a cerebral exercise, faith cuts to the heart of our being because we can have knowledge of God and not have it impact our lives whatsoever. But the question of do we trust in him calls us to play a game of higher stakes. For Simeon, he was staking his life on the fact that one day he was going to see the Messiah. As you read in Luke, he was righteous, he was devout. He did not just sit around in despair waiting for Christ to come, or, nor did he put his faith on the back burner and do whatever he wanted in the meantime while waiting for Christ to come. 
but he chose to follow God. He chose to follow his law. He chose to live peaceably. He chose to treat others with respect and dignity and love. And he chose to do this even in the midst of what must have been ever increasing doubts that God was ever going to fulfill his promise. We don't know when Simeon got the promise that he was going to see the Messiah. It could have been several decades earlier. It could have been the previous week. But one thing was certain, Simeon's time on earth was running out. And he was much closer to the end of his life than his beginning. And so, of course, there must have been doubts that God was going to fulfill his promise. And the temptation to despair and to give up must have been there. But Simeon does not do that. Instead, he remains pious. He remains faithful. He trusts in God. And the blessing of this passage is that we get to see him be rewarded for that. He finally gets a glimpse of a Messiah. And is thus able to say, Lord, let me depart in peace, knowing that your salvation is at hand. He staked his whole life believing that God would be the one to fulfill his promises. He lived his whole life believing God as trustworthy. And I think today we live in a day and age where our challenge is the same as Simeon and Anna's. They waited half a millennia where we've been waiting 2,000 odd years. Do we have faith in God and his promises? Do we trust him? Because once again, this Advent season, we're faced with the grim reality that the world in which we live in does not look like it's getting any better anytime soon. We live in a world where in the last two weeks, we have seen our system of justice fail so miserably and spectacularly to deliver anything close to justice in the courts of Ferguson and New York. We live in a world where instead of the poor, disenfranchised, and marginalized being protected, it seems that the powerful protect their own, the rich get richer, and mercy is in short supply to those who need it most. We live in a world where instead of coming together as one and living in peace, we seem to devise new and creative ways to hate one another and destroy one another. And on the streets of Ferguson and in many other cities this week, we have had the illusion of our racial unity exposed. We've been forced to see that, in fact, deep in our hearts of this country, we are still a people divided by race. We live in a world, too, where we keep stripping God's larger creation of its goodness. We keep felling forests. We keep polluting oceans. We keep killing species, all in the name of profit and convenience. We live in a world where, despite our best efforts, nothing seems to get better. And all this while, we have been promised that one day our Savior, Jesus Christ, will return to raise the dead to life, to make all that is wrong right, to depose those who cling to injustice and mercilessness, to usher a kingdom of peace where lion and lamb lay down together, where divisions will cease between race and religion and sex and creed. But he's not here yet. And so we have the same temptation that the Israelites had before Jesus arrived. We can choose to despair, say it's not going to happen or not going to happen soon enough. And so we can choose to retreat back into our safe places and turn a deaf ear to the world, dig our heads in the sand and just think about nice Christianly things within the confines of our walls. Or we can choose to give up altogether and say it's better to play by the rules of the world than to hold out for God's pipe dream. <laughs> and indeed, this is the choice that many Christians have made. To shy away from the world's pain or contribute to it. Or we can be like Simeon and Anna and choose to have faith that God will fulfill his promises. And not to know in our minds about Jesus and not to pay lip service to our religion, but to live in such a way that we believe our faith to be true. To have a faith that looks at the brokenness of the world around us and still believes, 
salvation is at hand, still trust that God will see this through. To have a faith where we choose to treat people with respect, with dignity, with love, not because we expect some sort of reward from it, but because we trust someday when God returns, respect and dignity and love is going to be the norm of our existence. To stand by the disenfranchised, to stand by those who are discriminated against, to stand against unjust powers, not because we believe somehow our actions will cause any permanent change to the system, but to remind the world that we believe Jesus is coming again. And the days of all that is evil and wicked and unjust in this world, they are numbered. And we trust that God will do this. We can choose to trust that what Jesus said is true. He is coming back. And if we persevere, we'll be rewarded in the end by his return, by his establishment of a kingdom of peace that will reign forever. And this is the heart of Advent. I know earlier I said Advent is the time when we wait, when we remember Jesus coming at Christmas. And that is, again, it's true, but it's only half of the story. Because I've said it before, but I think the trick the devil plays on us every Christmas is to keep Jesus in Christmas past. To keep Jesus in a manger, to keep it just about some angels singing to shepherds, some wise men bringing the least child-friendly gifts of all time. <laughs> really? Myrrh? <laughs> really? <laughs> but it is the Christmas... You know, the devil tries to tell us it's the Christmas of the nativity play that's all cuteness and cuddliness. It's the Christmas where we can take pictures of it and post it on Instagram. It's the Christmas of the little Lord Jesus asleep on the hay. Because then our faith is firmly rooted in the past. And the Jesus we worship is a cute, adorable baby in a manger. Then Jesus can be rendered toothless and powerless. Then he's irrelevant to our modern world. But Advent is not just a time to remember the past. It's a time to be reminded of our future. It's to be, to be reminded that Jesus did indeed fulfill his promise once before to come as the Messiah so we can trust him when he says he's coming again. It's a time to be reminded that we can have faith in him and we can stake our lives on that promise. And we can be salt and light to the world, living in righteousness and grace. We can choose to love others sacrificially and try to love others as Christ loved us. We can stand up against injustice, whether in our homes, in our neighborhood, in our city, and in our country, because we can trust that he will complete the good work he began in us. And when he comes to usher in a kingdom of peace without end, So there's one final thing I think faith calls us for. I've talked a lot about Simeon in the sermon, but I haven't forgotten about Anna. I think that's my favorite part of this passage. There's one more response of faith that Anna exemplifies perfectly. When Anna sees Jesus for the first time and sees that he is the Messiah to come, first of all, she gives thanks to God. And that is something we need to keep doing. No matter what happens, no matter what's going on in the world, we need to keep thanking God for what he has done and what he will do. But she doesn't stop there. Then she starts telling everyone she knows, the Messiah is here. The ultimate sign of faith, of our trust in God and in the kingdom he is bringing, is when we start telling others about the trust we have in our coming Messiah and the salvation he brings. Whether by what we say or what we do, our faith ultimately is not our own. It's meant to be shared. So my challenge to you in a world filled with brokenness and seeming hopelessness do you trust our God to deliver? Do you trust our God to save?
Do you trust he's coming again? And do you have faith enough to stake your whole life on it? So that when he comes with trumpet sound, or oh, may I then be in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before his throne. Will you pray with me? Lord, we do live in a world of brokenness and seeming hopelessness. And Lord, we do mourn that. Um, today we join with the communities of Ferguson and New York and other places in the country that are hurting because of what has happened. But Lord, teach us to rise above that and to remember that you have promised to come again to redeem this world. Lord, when we lose perspective amidst the darkness around us, keep our eyes focused on your coming kingdom and help us to trust you with all our heart. Give us faith enough to stake our lives on your promises. We pray and ask this in your name. Amen. Amen.